Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why am I focused on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash egg or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another interview today with Pierre Ville co-founder of Varolex and Bleu Blanqueur. Bleu Blanqueur is an association created in 2000 to promote a responsible agriculture with the objective of improving nutritional environmental quality of our food. In order to feed humans well, it's necessary to start by looking after our crops and the health of our animals. This is the founding principle. Of course, we have a lot to discover here. So the association brings farmers, companies, doctors, scientists, and consumers, that's a mouthful, together. And it has a presence worldwide, although it was born in France. Welcome, Pierre. Thank you. So we met through, an, or we met virtually through an interview of John Kempf, which I'll definitely link below. But I would love to, for anybody that didn't listen to that, to have a short introduction, first of all, to you, like what brought you to agriculture? And of course, then we'll unpack uh, Bleu Blanqueur and we'll dive deep into a lot of things from Omega-3 to 6 to the diet of animals to methane, etc., etc. But first of all, what brought you to agriculture and to spend your working life in that? I decided to go to agricultural studies when I was very young because it, it's a question of a family history, etc. So I became an agronomist in the 70s and my first job was in animal production. It was a period of uh, intensive agriculture and it was not my, my roots. It, it was not the way we produce it at this time. Uh, pigs, milk, eggs, etc. It was not exactly the way I, I dreamed when I was young. And in, uh, in 92, with uh, five friends, we created a company, an animal nutrition company. The name is Valorex. And it, it started with an idea that we, we have to be less dependent of the soybean importation from America, from Brazil and from the United States because of agronomy, just to create a balance in the soil to produce more protein seeds in France, less corn, to have balanced diets for animals using protein seeds is better for the soil. So we started from the soil, because when you use the protein seeds, like lupin, horse bean, peas, etc., faba, you put nitrogen in the soil from the air, so it's less fertilizer. A lot of nitrogen remains in the soil for the wheat you do after. It, it's exactly what I learn in the agricultural studies in the first years doing rotation during uh, one year you make a uh, pea and after or alfalfa and after you produce wheat etc and uh, well this is very old nothing new but just to recreate the link so t- to be short we we also used uh, a technology to cook the seed because these crude seeds are not very digestible for the animals and we started we started to say to breeders, uh, to farmers, okay, it's more expensive than soybean, that imported soybean, but maybe it's better for you, for the soil, for the animals, etc. And the farmers are technical people. They don't believe you if you don't have a lot of uh, proofs of, uh, of data. And so we published our first paper in the scientific press in 95. We created the company in 92. And in 95, it was the first paper with the, the French uh, National Research Institute for Agronomy. And it was a, an improvement of the fertility of the cow. When you use a, a mix of a lupin, a pea, a, a linseed compared to soybean, we improved the fertility, which is quite important for a dairy farmer. And uh, 
somebody in the research institute had an explanation based on the fact that uh, in grass and linseed you have omega-3 fatty acid and in corn and soybean you have more omega-6 fatty acid and the balance between omega-6 and omega-3 was important for the fertility of the cow. And just to go back one step, because when you, you said the first years of studying agriculture, it was about these rotations, it was about the local legumes, etc. for the feed. And then sort of when you started working, the soybean import started. That was more or less the moment or the period where a lot of this import started. And you mentioned you weren't very happy with that. That triggered starting your own company. Is that correct? Absolutely correct, yeah. Starting from the soil, not necessarily from the health of the animal or also the health of the animal. We started from the soil and there was an, an event only old people like me remember that uh, in the 70s there was a, a US embargo on soybean. And for all the, the French farmers, it was terrible because the, the price of the soybean increased so much. And so we, they started and we started realizing that uh, maybe producing energy crop in, uh, in Europe and in, in protein crops from, uh, from the US or from Brazil is not a good solution. It's risky. Yeah. yeah, it's risky. And so the omega-3-6 ratio is something we're going to come back to a few times. But so this person in this research institute basically accidentally started a movement because this is something you didn't know. You found out that that might be the case why the fertility of these cows was improving because it's the ratio not necessarily the quantity of omega-3 and 6 that is important if i understand correctly but please explain a bit why is this ratio omega-3 and 6 so important for the cow or the animals in general and also us okay so i'll go back to a nobel prize in 82 <laughs> in 82 the nobel prize was attributed to three researchers, two Swedish and one English. It was about something that was a surprise for them in, in their research. You know, in the body, in the human body, it was about, uh, it was a Nobel Prize for physiology and, uh, and human medicine. In the body, there was a lot of uh, antagonist molecules. For instance, you have uh, some molecules like insulin stored the sugar in the body, in the cells. And other molecules, like, I don't remember the name now, <laughs> and some molecule distort the sugar. And the, the balance is always important. But what was funny with the omega-6 and the omega-3, they have to work in a certain balance, but we don't synthesize them. The insulin is synthesized by men, but not the omega-6, not the omega-3. And the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 is very important for inflammation. For instance, uh, omega-3 are roughly omega-3 are anti-inflammatory, omega-6 are pro-inflammatory molecules. Same for the aggregation, the platelet aggregation. Omega-6 are pro-aggregation, omega-3 are anti-aggregation. Same for the fertility. You need some prostaglandin for the cycle at certain moment is for uh, back to the cows <laughs> for the fertility of the cow you need omega-6 at a certain moment you need omega-3 at another moment but when there is an unbalance in the diet of the cow as well as in the diet of the man uh, then the problem occur we started with this little <laughs> anecdote little, basically little yeah. door on the fertility of the cow but the story is always the same, like at, at this time in uh, 95, the unbalance doesn't come from the body. The unbalance comes from the diet, come from the plate, if you remain, or come from the, the balance. When a cow eats grass, we used linseed, we decided to use linseed, which is not a protein seed, because we knew that the fatty acid of linseed are the same as the fatty acid of grass. But we didn't know the properties. It was just a way of thinking that it's a, it's the same that in grass and in corn and soybean, it's not the same. Corn and soybean are quite rich in omega-6. So the link between uh, harmony in the nature, in the environment, and uh, balance in our body did exist. After, in the 30 years later, we just measure the impact of a, a renewed balance on the animal horse, human horse, and also soil source. That's the, why I, I like to talk about this nice story. On a daily basis, it was not always exciting, 
But when you have a look on the, this last 30 years, it was, it's very exciting because we did a lot of, uh, of work, of, of research work on balancing the soil, balancing the animal diet and balancing human diet. And when did you, because you opened this small door on the ratio omega-3, omega-6, which is absolutely crucial because you would sort of think uh, omega-3 is good for you, omega-6 is bad, let's get as much, but it's not the case. You need both in limited quantities, but you need especially the right ratio. But you saw that in a cow and you saw that in fertility ratio and you thought, okay, that's interesting. You start probably changing your feed and changing the feed you're selling as a company. But that's quite a step to go from there and building a successful company to help dairy farmers work with their fertility and improve to go from there to what it means for us. Where was that step? Where did you open the second door basically to human health? So let's go back to 92, I created the company. In 95, that's the first trial with the impact on fertility of the cow. And uh, so still discussing, I'm used to say when you are in the, in the research area, you do an experiment but because you have a question and you expect an answer. Generally, at the end of the experiment, you have half of an answer and two or three new questions. At this period, we say, oh, okay, I, I, at this time, internet didn't exist, so I go to the library of the university and uh, I read a lot of things on omega-6, omega-3, the balance, etc. And we have the idea of saying, uh, well, if it's important for the cow, maybe the, the nutritional quality of the milk can also be enhanced and better for human health. So 97, we started always with this National Research Institute, a big experiment on the impact of animal feed on the nutritional quality of the milk, the egg, meat, etc. And we published it. And then I met a, a second funny story. I met a cardiologist in a congress and he told me, well, it's interesting what you do, but not so much because, uh, of course, you have more omega-3 in the egg or in the milk, you have less. Omega but what will happen when the men eat the egg or drink the milk? Will this interesting omega-3 will be used by the metabolism or they will be oxidized as a common source of energy? You, you cannot say anything, any claim. Uh, so you proved that you could change through the feed of the animal, you could prove that you could change the ratio to get to the ideal ratio in an egg, in the meat, in the milk. But this doctor was saying, what does it do to us? Yeah. We knew we improved the, the ratio in the plate, but what happened in the body? You have to do a clinical trial. Sounds funny. So yeah. A clinical trial. We were a small company of 20 people. So we found uh, money. We were funded by... Uh, the French state and the local government of uh, Brittany. And we did this clinical trial. This was probably the most exciting period of my professional life because we nobody knew what would happen. We took two groups of uh, volunteers, healthy volunteers, two groups of uh, 40 people, and, and they received exactly the same diet, same quantity of egg, butter, meat, cheese, etc. And we did blood samples. Only the animals had not the same diet. When we read the, the paper, it was difficult because, so we said diet for the animal diet and a regimen for the human regimen, ah, yeah, of to, course, to yeah. be clear. So it was the same human regimen with different animal diet. And we did blood sample to the volunteer every two weeks. And after only one month, it was a double blind crossover trial, very strong in terms of statistics. We completely changed the composition, not only of the blood, but also of the composition of the red blood cells, which means all the cells of the body change, not according to the human regimen, but according to the animal diet. So wow. two steps longer in the food chain, there is a strong influence on the composition. You are what you eat or what you ate, ate. Yeah, yeah but we are not exactly what we eat. We are also what the chicken eat. What the chicken you eat, I've eaten before, yeah. Absolutely. So, so that, that was fantastic. And that was the second step of my professional life because with the investigator, the, the medical doctor who, who did the study and um, my friends from the research institute, we said that it's, it's fantastic in terms of uh, public health because usually nutrition, let's say before us, Nutrition was eat more that and less that. 
eat more broccoli, eat more kale, eat less, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But you prove that it's not more that it's how it's grown. Exactly. That actually influences the outcome. So it, it opened new doors in, the, in terms of public health, but what say my friend, and they convinced me not to continue in a, in a company project, uh, but in a, I remember they said, uh, you cannot say you improved the uh, public health, but you will do it uh, only you and you will not uh, invite your competitors to do it. If you speak of uh, climate or public health, you cannot do it alone. You cannot keep it in a for-profit in a company. You need to open it up. Yeah. So we created this Bleu Blanquer Association after the first clinical trial. And where are you now? Like 20 years later, Bleu Blanquer is massive. You're in many different countries. But just to give an idea, what is Bleu Blanquer and where are we in 2020 in terms of impact? Because it's been an enormous impact, especially in France and Belgium and other countries you're starting now, but especially your home countries. It's a really big movement. Yeah, it's probably because we had no money at, at the beginning. So we created... A, we hear that a lot in this podcast, like you get very creative if you have no money at the beginning. <laughs> Not probably. If I did this job in a big pharmaceutical company, probably uh, it will not be the same. So we started with an association. It's quite complicated to go from the, let's say, from the cow to the consumer. If you take in all the countries of the world, you have uh, in the stores, you have what they call omega-3 milk. Omega-3 milk is usual milk from a factory, and you put two drops of the fish oil inside and begin. Uh, it's very easy to do in, from the industrial side. But for us, it was more complicated because you have to, to separate the milk coming from uh, grass-fed cows from the milk coming from uh, corn-soy-fed cows. Industry people don't like it. It has to be a completely separate product, basically. It has to be the whole chain because the milk cannot be mixed with other milk because you lose your health qualities. Exactly. So, so of course, the dairy companies didn't like the idea because the, the cost was uh, so important. Uh, so we created the, the association with uh, seven sectors. The, the plant producers, uh, people of uh, linseed, of uh, alfalfa, lupin, etc., one member is a company or a cooperative or an association. So the plant producer, then the breeders, then the animal nutrition company, all my competitors, all the Valorex competitors at this time, then the processors, which means dairy companies, meat companies, mm -hmm. then the retailer, and the last one was the consumers. I forgot one. The seventh was the on-farm processors, the mm -hmm. farmers, processors, etc. And this was the first pillar. The second pillar was what we call the communities. It was uh, consumers, farmers, medical doctors, chefs, which was quite important in France, but without any economic uh, interest in the story. And the third one was the scientific uh, board. And all these three pillars send the people to the administration council. So it, 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 it was very interesting to learn, to hear, from the others. I think in my professional life, one of the most difficult things was to, to break the walls between a scientist and a farmer, between a consumer and a medical doctor, etc. Everybody, I don't know if it sounds in, in English, but in French, there was a, a writer, Pierre Rabhi, he, he talked about the tailorization of the salt. Everybody do well in his own uh, compartment. Nobody makes a full suit. All these people discussing together, it was very interesting. So this was the creation. The governance was very important. And uh, today in, in France, it's uh, between 5 uh, to 10% of the different animal sectors, 10% in the, of all the pig produced in France, 7% of the eggs, etc., etc. Now we have also wild fish. I learned a lot of things when you wow. say there is a lot of omega-3 in the sardine. But it depends when it's uh, fished, it depends uh, when, where, it depends on the oil you use to cook the sardines, etc. Like always, it's not eat more sardines, it's what kind of sardines, where they're caught, how, etc. Just to unpack one piece, I mean, there's so many things to think, but just when you mentioned the vegetable proteins, the growers of that, and the grass-fed cows, these are like the supplement they get, or how... 
are the cows or many of these cows are 100% grass fed or how does that work for the simple non-farmer listening to this? Like, why do they need lupine or flaxseed or something else that you mentioned? Well, thank you. That's a very important point <laughs> because the, the more important things to my eyes, it's the measurement. Once you said the scientific board of Bleu Blancœur say, okay, a Bleu Blancœur uh, milk, it's uh, with a ratio uh, omega-6, omega-3 of one to one. So after the, the farmer can choose the better way for him to produce this milk, it, the obligation of results. Which is key. Just, just to, to iterate that again, it, the obligation of result is something that sets it apart from almost any other certification body. Like organic is based on practices, but not on results. Most other things, fair trade, etc., are based on practices, not on results. This is like, I'm a farmer, I have chickens and I grow, I, 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 they lay eggs and I'm only certified if my eggs contain this and this ratio of omega-3 to 6, because that's what you're looking for. And it's a very, I mean, there could be many other things, but the omega-3 to 6 is a very good trigger because it shows everything else, basically, that, that I have been doing around the chickens. And it's very difficult to cheat with. That's what the, but I need to show those results. Otherwise, I cannot be called Bleu Blancœur eggs. Yeah. And you know, the, the marketing people love claim like uh, free range eggs. Free range eggs, you see a lot of grass on the egg box, but not uh, in reality when you analyze the egg, the ratio between omega 6 and omega 3, at least in France, it's about 40, uh, 40, 30. For Bleu Blanqueur eggs, it's five. When it's five, you're sure I have uh, laying hands in my garden. <laughs> I know when I give them grass, uh, when I cut grass and I give them, uh, the, the ratio omega-6 to omega-3 is one to one. When you give uh, cooked linseed to the laying hens, you have the same ratio, five to one. So just to say like free range or organic, I mean, I, I, you called it somewhere, I, I think in the interview with John, like if they get organic soy, obviously you can call them organic eggs, but they're like an inflammation bomb, basically, if you would buy the, the normal ones you buy in the supermarket, because they don't have the obligation of result they don't need that ratio of three to six that you need to or that your farmers need to show and we discussed with uh, some uh, uh, grass-fed uh, organization in the in the world it's quite complicated because we i think it's fantastic grass-fed but if you have the obligation of results if you have the measurement the better of course it will give an added value to the product it's grass-fed great and because it's grass-fed you have a good uh, omega-6, omega-3 ratio in the egg or in the meat or in the milk. But sometimes it's difficult because the people have in mind that the uh, obligation of, uh, of means uh, description is enough. We don't think so. We have people in, uh, in Bleu Blanqueur. Uh, when I started Valorex, it was 100% organic. So I, I know quite well some people of the organic movement. And we say we... We have the same vision. We, uh, we have a lot of people that produce organic and Bleu Blanqueur. We say in the toolbox, we need a lot of things. Obligation of means is something. Obligation of results is something else. And if you can have the two together, it's fantastic. And is it easy to measure this ratio three to six? Because that's something, I mean, it's amazing to have obligation of results. If it's easy to measure for me as a farmer or to, if it's incredibly expensive, I'm not going to be playing with the one to five ratio. I'm not going to be buying different seeds. I'm not going to be changing my management because it's too difficult basically to get that done. But in this case, is it easy? Yeah, it's easy. You, you mentioned in the people you interviewed, uh, our common friend, uh, Dan Kittredge in the US. And we discussed a lot about making the measurement uh, easy. That's the, 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 it's a fantastic tool. If you can measure today in uh, for, for Bleu Blanqueur, fatty acid profile, cost in, in a lab with the official method, it cost about uh, 150 euro per one uh, sample, a little less. But we developed uh, spectroscopies. We, we did research also on technology because we think to tomorrow it will be less and less uh, expensive. I bought the device, the nutrient meter, when it came out. Yeah, uh, the first version, the 3D printed one. Well, it's not expensive uh, no. and it will be l less and less. But it's key. But it's so, so different if you... If farmers uh, listen to us, once you, you say, okay, that's the objective, that's the obligation of results, 
have to do what you want, but exactly everything. But uh, we also have an obligation of means. We, uh, for instance, all the additives, the chemical additives, etc., are forbidden. But uh, you can choose grass, you can choose linseed, you can choose alpha alpha. You can source all the source of omega trees are uh, correct for you. And it's fantastic to see that the farmers changing their systems from year to year to adapt to the Bleu Blanc uh, obligation of results. Are you getting stricter or not? Like it's a moving 20 years ago or what like is the, the result and the obligation of means? Like, do I need to keep improving as a farmer? Are you making it more tricky or do you want me to keep improving my practices? We change all the time. Uh, after discussion between the consumers, the farmers, you know, the price is very important because we, once again, when you deal with public health and uh, climate, you cannot say I do it only for the 10% of the people who can buy it. You have to do it for everybody. So the accessibility, we did things quite interesting for tomorrow, but of course we incorporate new demand about uh, animal welfare, about the uh, link to the local production, etc. But we want the farmer to be paid for it. And second, the consumer have an accessibility to this product. We have an agreement with the, the French government, which is not bad. They encourage, they say you can write uh, uh, Bleu Blanqueur is supported by the French Ministry of Health, Environment and Agriculture. But we have to prove that the overcost is not over 5% of the same product. So basically, when I buy an egg or, let's say, a piece of meat of a pig, the difference in price between conventional, let's say, relatively extractive soybean grown, etc., and Blood Blanker certified is maximum 5%. Yeah, and it's generally it's less. Which is amazing. Yeah. Can I say what is my dream today? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that measurement is the first keyword for Blood Blanker. The second is accessibility. So we we did with this five uh, percent maximum over cost during this last twenty years, and uh, in two thousand and sixteen we created a, a fund to encourage the what we call the agro environmental transition. The idea is to receive money for the fund, which is directly given to the farmer according to the quantity of. Uh, CO2 reduction in his uh, production. So a measurement, we measure this reduction and the farmer receive money directly from uh, companies, for instance, telephone company, banks, etc. To say simply, the, maybe it's too simply, but uh, today the rich people, they buy, uh, they are concerned, in, at least in France, by health, environment. When I was young, the um, Rich people were fat, <laughs> and the poor people uh, were not. Today, it's the opposite. Yeah, the way around. Yeah. And uh, so these people who don't really need this uh, higher uh, quality product, they have the money to buy it. And the poor people, they are condemned to what they, they call in France the premier prix, first price, which is low cost uh, food. The, po the poverty premium, yeah. Yeah. And our dream is to use this fund to give money to the farmer. So they produce in a better quality system. They are paid for it, but the price of the product remains the same. The concept with the retailer chain in France, I'm very happy of this because it's, uh, it's the money of the rich people, but used to make the poor people uh, eating in a very good quality. And if you have not only 10% of the people who eat uh, well, but uh, 80%, for instance, then you will really have an impact on the climate, the public health, etc. There's so much to unpack in that. To start with, just to give an idea of size of like last year or the last year you have data, Blobunker certified products, what kind of value was that in total? Well, in Euro, Blobunker money, Blobunker uh, has uh, 25 uh, employees and the money comes from the economical member. If they use the, the collective brand, they pay 0.2% of the products sold with the, the brand to Bleu Blanqueur. So we have a, a, a budget in Bleu Blanqueur of something like 3 million euros. But the global turnover of the brand last year 
2019 was over 2 billion euro in France. And uh, France is about uh, 80% of the turnover. Mm -hmm. And after in the 11 other countries uh, in Europe and, uh, and a few other countries. So 2 billion euros, it start to be something uh, significant. Yeah. yeah. And to unpack the, the ecosystem service payments you mentioned, you developed actually a measuring framework for methane, because that's obviously a question immediately, but people say, okay, great. Animal protein can be not necessarily medicine, but definitely a prevention tool for inflammatory diseases, which are many of our rich world diseases at the moment. But what about the environmental cost? What about the methane? What about, I mean, we are all, I wouldn't say brainwashed, but definitely bombarded with messages that animal protein is about the worst thing you can do. It's worse than buying a Hummer and driving it all day long. So what is, I mean, it's a, it's a bad way of setting up the question, but what is your response to like the animal, the environmental impact of animal protein? You've done a lot of research into that and actually you've been paying farmers to change their practices by taking rich people money, which I think is, makes you like the Robin Hood of, uh, yeah. <laughs> of agriculture. But can you explain that 2016, you got some awards for that as well. And you actually, you started again with measurement and how to compensate farmers for this. And in this case, it was specifically about the thing we always discuss, which is methane. And again, it came down to feed of animals, which is, I think is fascinating. But explain a bit that process and how that came about. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll come back at the beginning of the story. I said in terms of health and, and nutrition, before Bleu Blanqueur, the only, the only message that was heard was uh, eat more that and uh, less this, etc. I think it's the same for environment. Today, the main message is eat less meat, eat more uh, protein, seeds, etc., etc., more legumes. And, and it's, it's quite true, but uh, there are also huge difference in terms of a uh, carbon footprint between the different way of production. We started with the methane of the cow. We, we started in 2001. The, the first paper wow. was in 2001. At this time, you didn't hear so much about uh, climate change, but there was uh, another uh, researcher, it was her idea, to say uh, she, she made a little paper, a very, not in a big uh, scientific newspaper. She gave uh, linseed, cooked linseed to goats, and she had the idea of measuring the pH in the rumen of the goat, so animal health to measure the nutritional profile of the milk, so human health, but also to go inside the rumen to measure the methane emitted by the goat. And she made a lovely paper about, uh, is it possible to improve in the same time uh, footprint? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's fantastic. Uh, Was it possible? Yeah, we decreased the, the methane. So as you said before, what is important is the measurement. So from a, a biological point of view, the link between uh, omega-3, methane emission, the composition of the milk is very clear. Very you have uh, thousands, hundreds of, uh, maybe not thousands, but hundreds of paper on this. When a cow or a ruminant or goat, etc., eat grass, grass or linseed or alfalfa, she has uh, omega-3 in the rumen, and this omega-3 has a negative impact on the bacteria that produce methane. From this idea, it was quite uh, easy to, to build an idea that uh, so you can measure in the milk the environmental footprint of the milk. Uh, without having to measure the methane that comes out. Huh? So we did that. We had new papers in the scientific press with the link between uh, methane emission and milk fatty acid composition. The first paper was in 2009, so we, we saw correlation and we, we decided to create a, a method. So we put it to the, the French Ministry of Environment in 2011. So the experts approved the, the method. And then in 2012, at the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, it was approved again. So today, we give money to farmer according to the measurement, which is a, a indirect but very good measurement. You measure the milk and you know how many grams of medicine. 
And what's the difference between like a normal milk I buy that is grown or even organic, but is grown on mostly soy compared to a blood bunker one where the ratio omega-3 and 6 is, is big? Like what's the, the range between those two methane? From 20 to 30% less methane emission. And methane emission is half of the carbon footprint of the milk. That's significant. Yeah. And we continued and two weeks ago in, uh, in France, there was an official database on the footprint of a different uh, product. And uh, so now they did it, for instance, for chicken. You have the carbon footprint of a conventional chicken, organic chicken, a red label chicken, bleu blanqueur chicken. And the bleu blanqueur uh, chicken compared to, to conventional is more than 30% less carbon footprint, which for the reason that we don't use uh, imported soybean and we use uh, protein seeds. And when you use protein seeds, you use less nitrogen fertilizer. So you produce less nitrogen protoxide, which is a very strong uh, warming effect, etc. Mm -hmm. So to go to the conclusion, it's not only eat less meat, it's also take care of the way a meat is produced. If I took my example, eating 30% less chicken, okay, it's interesting, but eating the same quantity of a chicken with 30% less carbon footprint, it's absolutely the same results. And of course, I don't say you have to, we have to eat less meat and less animal product, for sure. Uh, at least in uh, in Europe and uh, in Northern America, in the rich countries, we have to eat less. But we also, in the same time, have to take care of the way this uh, meat and animal products are produced. It's the same for nutrition and environment. It's not only uh, consumer behavior. The, the farmer behavior is at least as important as the consumer's behavior. They hold the key for our health. Can you say something about... Uh, a paper that you were working on. I don't know if it came out yet because you published many, many. I mean, I, I will definitely link to your research page on the website, but on breast milk, on pregnant women, you were setting it up when John Kempf interviewed you. I don't know if it's already published, but can you say something about that research study? No, it's not published because the, the, the experiment is not finished. We had to stop because of this uh, COVID. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, too bad. But can I uh, give you... The we're starting a new very... Of course. Yeah, no, no. I mean, this is the one I know, but if you have something more exciting, then please share. Now that the breast milk was really interesting for me because it's not only the link between... We took a mother, volunteer mother, that practice breastfeeding to the baby, and we measure the composition of the milk, of the breast milk, and we measure also the composition of the gut flora of the baby, inside the sheet of the baby. I don't know the other word, the faces. Uh, so it's not only a link between uh, what happened in the, in the first step of the food chain to the plate uh, and to the, the blood and the milk of the mother, but also to the next generation, to the baby, etc. But we, when the COVID story uh, appeared at the beginning of this year, um, at the television, I was uh, watching the television like everybody, and uh, they were talking uh, of the cytokine storm. And I realized that people don't die from the, the virus itself, they die from what they call the um, uh, SDR, acute respiratory disease. Yeah, yeah it's a syndrome, something like that. It's you have too much inflammation, you have too much cytokine storm. Comes back to the inflammation discussion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, after you, you look at the, what happened in the world and you see that countries like uh, Japan, South Korea, Hong Kong, but also in, uh, in Europe, uh, Finland, Portugal, uh, Norway, uh, countries where they eat a lot of uh, fishes with a lot of omega-3 and not so many victims. Uh, Japan is, is, is really something uh, interesting because the, they have... 10 deaths per million habitants, when in France we have uh, 450 or 500. So you're saying it could be a connection to the omega-3, omega-6. Did you see a lot of, I mean, it was actually one of my questions. Did you see a lot of extra interest in Bleu Blanqueur in this discussion as food, as prevention, maybe not food as medicine, but definitely food 
as prevention. Like, have you seen something shift in in the last nine months, eight months, whatever, <laughs> when this hit? Not at all. It's terrible because everybody who's in France is talking about the new drug, about the new vaccine. It's like in, in agriculture, I'm used to say in agriculture, now it's impossible to say there is a new pest. We have to, to build a new pesticide. But in human health, it's still like that. New pest, new pesticide. Wow. So we're behind in human health compared to agriculture. I think so. I really think so. I have the chance sometimes to discuss because we, so we, we designed two new clinical trials. Uh, one with a patient um, with symptomatic uh, problem of the, of the COVID and another one with old people in, the, in terms of a, a primary prevention. And when I discuss with the hospital, university hospital in, uh, in Rennes, in my town, of course, the nutrition professor is, uh, uh, agree with me. It's an inflammatory disease, the COVID. It's not only a virus problem. And kill the virus is probably interesting, but... Uh, reduce the symptom. He, he told me, well, maybe I'll tell you that because I think it's a fantastic comparison. This professor of nutrition told me, Pierre, you know, the scorbut, you know, the scorbut disease, it was a disease in the, for the sailor. Ah, yeah, yeah. The, I know it in Dutch. The sailors that span basically sailing to Asia at some point started yeah. to have serious issues and, and they fixed it. But of course, you're going to tell me probably it's different with vitamin C. Yeah, it's the same story. And, and uh, it's one sailor, then two, three, and uh, one of the. So they, they said it's probably an in infectious uh, disease. And at this time, they they treated it like this. It was in the 16th century, and it was a, a Dutch and then an English doctor that realized that uh, lime and juice, uh, lime and juice, with lime and juice, the symptom disappeared. And of course, lime and juice is not a drug. It's not a vaccine. Yeah. And they take two centuries to realize that uh, it was only a syndrome of a vitamin C deficiency. And I, I think it's, as this guy said, it's probably the same. Of course, there is a virus, there is a, a disease, but probably the large deficiency, you know, in a, it's not only interesting to say uh, omega-3 is interesting, is interesting for inflammation, but also to say in a, in France and all the Western countries, we only eat half of our needs in omega-3. About 70% uh, of the omega-3 comes through uh, animal product. And uh, animals were used to eat a lot of omega-3 uh, through grass, and now they eat a lot of omega-3 through corn and soybean. So the deficiency is very high. They eat a lot of omega-6, you mean? Now, through corn. Yeah. They eat a lot of omega-6, yeah, sorry. They eat a lot of omega-6. So we went from a lot of omega-3 in grasses to a lot of omega-6. And, and if you measure our blood now of an average person in France or in the Netherlands or in Germany, most of us have a, a, a the ratio of 3 to 6 is completely off. And so your study, these two clinical trials are going to look at people with symptoms and let's say the elderly that hopefully don't get it, but to prevent or to see if a diet of better ratio is going to help. The first one with people who are sick, it's a 20 days uh, study. Difficult to organize. You know, realize with all the <laughs> problems with yeah. the car. But uh, I'm quite sure we'll do it. I really hope it. Because the, if the results are good, people will see that uh, the solution is not only the new drug or the new vaccine. I will tell you something funny because to finance this uh, this is uh, this trial, I asked to, to the French uh, officials uh, because they had a lot of um, subsidies, money to to make clinical trials, etc. And uh, so we explained with the university doctors and the professors what we want to do. And at the end, they said exactly like uh, if omega-3 was a drug or a vaccine, they say, can we have a, a look, if the, the French government can have a look on the stores of uh, on the, the stocks of omega-3. And my friends say, yes, you have to nationalize all the, the fishers. <laughs> and, uh, and the grasslands. Yeah, yeah and the grasslands. Uh, the, the, in the mind of the people, when it's uh, human health, 
it's a drug or a vaccine. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's really... No, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So we... Uh, I don't sleep very well. I'm very busy with... Fascinating the... and disturbing at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah p- people don't accept it for animals. They don't accept it for, for the land, but they accept for them to find the solution only on the chemical way. As you say, it's fascinating and disturbing. And for me, if I'm optimistic, it's a fantastic way to prove what nutrition can do. When I discuss with these people at the this professor at the university hospitals, they say the problem is nobody's funding a, a clinical trial with nutrition. Yes, Danone, Nestle, the big companies, they do it for one molecule they have patented, but not for everybody. Not with real food. Yeah. And that is also not accessible. I want to be conscious of your time and, and finish with a few questions because I think we can spend, and I would love to check in, obviously, when the results are going to be published on this because I think it's something... I mean, we all talk about the importance of nutrition and the importance of how the food you eat has been grown or what you, you ate, ate, but to see that actually in clinical trials, to see it in, in randomized control ones, to see those results relatively quick. I mean, you talked about a month, in one of those first trials, and to see the impact of some relatively small changes in, in feed in some cases can have. But I want to switch a bit to the finance or the investment side of things and ask you a question which you maybe never thought about until I asked it in the pre-interview. But if you wake up tomorrow morning and you have a billion euros in your bank account, but you're an investor, so you cannot give it away, but you have to invest it. Could be very long term and could be 50 years, 20 years, whatever you want. How would you invest that 1 billion euros? So I, I understand I cannot take the money and go to the Bahamas with my wife. It's not, <laughs> it's not an issue. <laughs> if your investments go really well, then you can if you want. But yeah. <laughs> first you have to get to work. What would you focus on? Probably because it was our last conversation, but probably of funding uh, clinical trials. Because the, nobody does that. Which makes it by definition very, very important. I mean, there's there's a framework I use to look at that and like... It looks at importance of the problem. In this case, it's extremely important, our nutrition deficits, our nutrition issues. It looks at if it's fixable, which you've shown, but it also looks at neglectedness, like how many other people are doing it. And you're very clear in nobody's looking at clinical trials of nutrition. No, and why it's so important? Because I I think the consumer, everybody in the world, uh, I I started with the biology, biochemistry, etc., and now I'm very interested in uh, human science, like sociology, uh, uh, mass uh, psychology, etc. The the consumer they pay more. The or some, somebody says it's the omnivores uh, dilemma. We we are anxious because uh, if you're a koala, it's not very difficult. You only eat uh, eucalyptus. If you're a panda, you etc. etc. But the omnivorous people, we. <laughs> Uh, we are very anxious about uh, about food. And the real question for the consumer's behavior when he changes food, is it, is it good for me? Is it good for my health? If we, people are very anxious, they are very lost, they don't know what to do. Uh, but if they are really, if we, if we can provide all the proofs that, uh, yes, if you eat uh, the blanter. Do you think that's enough? Like, let's say you finance a hundred studies with, or a thousand studies with a billion dollars or a billion euros. How do, I mean, you've done that as well. Is that enough to really get this from 10% of, or to five or 7% of the, let's say the animal protein in France to get to 60, 70, 80%? Like, is, is proof enough or do we need more than, than proof? Because you've proven it already. You've showed it. It's not enough. It's just your, your question was about how to use this money. And uh, I'm happy that uh, we can do things without money. But for some kind of things, you really need money. Now, I think we have uh, enough people involved in this, in this question that if we really can bring results that it's linked to human health and they have to take care of this, then they will pay this 5% more uh, for the eggs, for the salad, for everything. Because we already do it through medicine. We already do it through our taxes, obviously. We do it for superfood that everybody suddenly buys for very crazy prices that don't do anything or a lot. 
And if you pay 5% and you actually get a, a health benefit, it seems like a really good deal. And this is the key. I think the nutritional, the, the health benefit is the key to pay a little more. A little is maximum 5%, as I said before, but it's enough to change things on the farmer's side. If you receive this money, so I talk of the fund, etc. Yeah. If you receive this money through the fund that we created, of course, if I have a uh, 1 billion uh, euro tomorrow, I will probably put it in my fund <laughs> and then give it to the farmer to change the way of, uh, of producing. But going tr through the consumer interest that I will not have 1 billion euro every year. And so it's uh, to, to use it as a transition fund as, as we do. Of course, not with 1 billion euro, but with the, I don't know. In the future, in the future. In yeah. the future. I will probably use it to for this transition fund. So, Two things uh, I try to do it uh, correctly. First is probably to fund these nutrition clinical trials to provide the proofs. Second is to put money in the fund to pay the farmers for the improvements they do in the way they produce with less carbon footprint, etc. And after, when once you get the results of the trials, I think you will not need to fund the farmer to produce. The transition is done. And it's probably, I hope, I'm still young, so I'll probably see. We'll see that people be be concerned and attentive to the the nutritional and the environmental quality of their food. All kinds of people, not only the ten percent of the very involved. So clinical trial and the transition fund. And and when you say fund, in because many people hear different things when when we say fund. I mean, I've interviewed a number of transition funds actually that that invest with farmers to transition their practices and then the farmer pays back in this case it's a payment but the farmer doesn't pay anything back or did i get that wrong no that the farmer that don't pay okay so it's a, a grant to the farmer, or it's a payment for ecosystem services coming from exactly in this case a rich person because you have a lot of money when you have a billion euros on your bank account or big banks or or telecom companies like you said well it's a question uh, i didn't know but uh, i think the two things are important because it's Transition fund, it's only a transition. At the end, if you have the results of the trial, I think people, because I discussed with, uh, with people that say, uh, I eat only free range eggs. I said, okay, so you, you take care of the welfare of the, of the hens? Absolutely not. But uh, if hens are stressed, they will not give good eggs for me. And that's typical, uh, it, it's not only a, a sentence. I think the real interest of people for paying more, it's, uh, it's their own benefit. It's like this. We are not so altruist as, uh, as we would like to be. It's their own and maybe their family. That, that's, uh, and that's why I'm doing these interviews and focusing on nutrient density, because if we can unlock the consumer demand, which you clearly have done with over 2 billion of sales, then because just as a final, I always say final question, it's never true, but as a farmer, in my interest as a farmer, how much is the, the extra payment I get through, let's say I'm, I'm raising pigs or eggs in terms of percentage, more or less what, what it makes it worth for me, but what, what do I get extra for basically raising it in this way and being tested on results? Well, I, I percentage, I don't know, but I will give you an, an example, a true example of pig production, which is the number one for Le Blanquet. To produce a, a pig is about 100 kilos, and the cost of the of the Bleu Blanqueur specification to have the obligation of results correct is about two to two point five euro per pig. Okay. No more soybean, no palm oil, linseed, etc. And the, the average payment for the farmer is between four to four point five euro uh, per pig. So they receive money to be in accordance to the, the obligation of means and results. And they receive what we call an incentive, because if you produce better quality, you must be more. And, and with this uh, two extra incentive euro, you can do other things for animal behavior, for animal welfare, or for environment, I don't know. And that's the way we did at the beginning. The blocker brand was not known by the people that didn't pay more for it. And then more and more, it's, uh, we can go from 0% uh, overcuts to 1, 2, 3, etc. Then the farmer receives more money and they can improve things. That's, that's a transition too. 
I really believe in transition and uh, the question about the way to finance it at a large scale is really interesting and things we, we think about. We're going to unpack that in another podcast. I want to thank you, Pierre, so much for your time this morning. I know you have other, a lot of other things to do. Thank you, first of all, so much for your work, for sharing. I will link to you as much as possible in the show notes below for people to find out more, to see if there's a local version of Blue Blanker in their country and other ways to get involved and to understand more of the connection between what you ate and what you ate ate on your personal health, but also definitely on the planet as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. If you would like to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture, find our video course on investinginregenerativeagriculture.com slash course. This course will teach you to understand the opportunities, to get to know the main players, to learn about the main trends and how to evaluate a new investment opportunity, like what kind of questions to ask. Find out more on investinginregenerativeagriculture.com slash course. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash investingregionag or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After a hundred interviews and more than a hundred hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you, if this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.